Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our seminar for National Families Week 2017. I'm Chris Carla Branch, Manager Children's Policy, and I'm very fortunate to be able to introduce our session today. Today, we are really lucky uh, to have here three keynote speakers who have earlier this week presented to the Child Aware Approaches Conference in Brisbane. And some of us in the room have already had the pleasure of, of hearing uh, from our speakers, and I can guarantee you that uh, it, you're in for some uh, really great uh, information this morning. Uh, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet today, the Ngunnawal peoples, and of the many lands on which we meet across the network today, and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to thank Families Australia for organising a great Child Aware Approaches conference. Um, and we have uh, colleagues from Families Australia here this morning, and particularly for convincing our speakers to stay an extra day so that we could hear from them and to make that uh, journey down to Canberra. We are going to hear from uh, several people this morning. Professor Frank Oberclade, Professor Keith Kaufman, and Professor Bridget Daniel, who will talk to us in succession. We also have Professor Patrick O'Leary, who will provide short reflections on the presentations after they've been completed. Uh, we very much hope that if there's still time after that, that we will have uh, a chance for some Q&A. Uh, I know these um, presentations are always a great opportunity for Q&A, and everyone is always very enthusiastic about that. So we'll certainly aim to, uh, to, to make that time. So starting with Professor Frank Oberclade, who is a leading Australian academic in early childhood development and early years learning and care. Professor Oberclade is the Foundation Director of the Centre for Community Child Health at the Royal Children's Hospital co-group leader of Child Health Policy, Equity and Translation at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and an honorary professor of paediatrics at the University of Melbourne. And today he will present on achieving sustained integrated policy focus on children's health and development, new approaches needed. Please welcome Professor Oakley. Um, thank you very much, Chris. And I would also like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to uh, elders past and present. It also gives me the opportunity to acknowledge the work of you in the room. When I speak overseas, I'm often the subject of considerable envy about the policy that's happening in Australia. And I know that uh, many of you people are responsible or contribute to it. So I'd like to acknowledge you and thank you for that. Um, and there is some terrific policy that's happened here in early childhood over the past decade. Today I want to take a different tack. I really want to talk about the glass being half empty rather than half full. And what I'd like to do is um, share with you what we know, what the research says, and there's a very robust and uncontested body of research that talks about the importance of early childhood, and I'll share that with you. Uh, present some data about what we are seeing in Australia in contemporary times really pose the question, why aren't we doing any better? And that's the glass half empty rather than the glass half full. Uh, ask the rhetorical question about, do we need a different approach to the way we develop policy and services to make a difference to children? And then suggest perhaps a framework for how we might uh, do better. So this is what the research says very clearly, that the foundations that are laid down in those early years of a child's life are critical just like the foundations of a house. If the foundations of a house are solid, then everything that follows above that is likely to be okay. If, found, if the foundations of a house are suboptimal because we took shortcuts or used cheap cement, then no matter uh, if we have gold-plated taps in the bathroom and chandeliers, everything that follows is at risk. And the science tells us that the brain architecture and skills are built in a very rigid, hierarchical, bottom-up sequence. And those foundations that are laid down in the years 
before the child begins school are crucially important because uh, those foundations then provide the foundations for everything that develops after that. And skills beget skills. The development of higher order skills is so much harder if those foundations are vulnerable. And what happens over time is the plasticity of the brain decreases and it gets harder and harder to change. So those of you in the audience that have tried to pick up a skill as an adult, I can see smiles everywhere. How many of you tried to learn a language or a musical instrument or picked up a sport? Of course you can do it, but it's like pulling hen's teeth. It's so much better to start early on when there's maximal brain plasticity. And so the research is very clear that biologically and economically, and I'll show you these data in a moment, it's so much better to get it right the first time than to go back later on and try and fix things up at a time when it's hard to do so. So we know also from the research that any sort of adversity that's operating in that child's environment has the capacity then to have a negative impact on the child's uh, development, mediated through a stress response. So the biology of adversity tells us that it begins in utero. And what happens is the fetus and the young developing child adapts to the particular environment of the time. So if there's a stressful environment, the fetus adapts and it's uh, advantageous in the short term, but then has long-term implications. Uh, Clive Hertzman talks about the biologic embedding of environmental events. So the genes provide the roadmap or the manual for how development occurs, but the way it occurs and the sequence depends very much on the environment. And where there's persi persistent stress, uh, where there's persistent adversity, that affects the biological systems, the immune and the cardiovascular and the metabolic regulatory system, and creates a long-term threat to the health and well-being of that child as he or she grows up. So this, this has been termed as, quote, toxic stress, um, where there's persistent stress in the young child's environment as he or she grows up. And we see this in instances of, of extreme poverty, in exposure to violence, where the children are the subjects of, of the violence, child abuse, sexual abuse. We see it with uh, parental mental health problems or substance abuse. Um, and where this is persistent, where there's adversity that's, that doesn't go away in that child's brain, it interferes very significantly with the way those brain circuits are laid down and that disrupts the brain architecture. And what's really important is there's no adult in that child's life who makes it okay. And indeed, the adult may be the cause of that stress in the first place. So these are some of the adult problems where the research is really emerging very strongly now that have their origins in pathways that begin in those early years. And you can see the diversity of problems. We're not just talking about psychosocial sorts of issues. We're talking about cardiovascular disease, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and so on. Um, and the research is becoming more robust by the month. But many, if not most, of these conditions we see in adult life have their origins in the early years of a child's life. Now, that has profound policy implications for every society, not just ours. So even if we don't uh, believe in children, the economists are now looking at these data with increasing interest and are coming to the conclusion that the best investment, the best economic investment that any country can make is in an early childhood development. And this is James Heckman, who won a Nobel Prize a decade or a decade and a half ago. He now goes around the world arguing for increased investment in early childhood. And he says that up until about the age of eight, that any money we spend on young children should not be considered expenditure. It should be considered investment because you get a yield back greater than what you put in. And you can see the earlier you begin, the greater the investment. And this is, these are quotes uh, or um, content from uh, PwC who did an evaluation of uh, the investment case for increased investment in uh, high quality childcare. And they argued very strongly that there was a very significant economic case for increased investment only in childcare, not talking about the rest of childhood. Decreased expenditure on unemployment, 
uh, decreased expenditure associated with remedial education, et cetera. And these are their data, that there's an investment in the first couple of years as you pour money into high quality childcare, but then over time, you get more and more money back. So economists are now coming to the table and saying, as I said before, this is the best investment that any country can make. And the research also is clear from that life course um, data that I showed you before, that the earlier we begin, the greater the efficacy and the lower the cost. As we go on in time, the costs of intervention becomes high and the evidence that, uh, of efficacy decreases. And most policy in every country in the world, for reasons that are understandable, are towards the right, uh, right side of this graph. We wait until problems become so entrenched and so visible that we can't ignore them anymore, then we throw money at it. And, and we look at that uh, intervention in, in dollar terms. But we intervene at a time when the cost is high and the effectiveness of intervention is low at a population level. So these are not scientific solutions to policy issues, they're political solutions. Um, and these are further uh, data, these are UK data that I've translated uh, in, into Australian dollar terms. So the cost of a child being looked after in secure accommodation, in social justice institutions is, in Australia is well over $200,000. And I think that I could write a generic life course that would fit perhaps 90% of those kids, starting from those very, very early years. And if you look at the cost of intervening early, if we just keep on going down into those early years, it's a no-brainer that rather than pay $200,000 a year when these kids are already in trouble and locked up and they're on a road to nothing, if we invested 10,000, 5,000, 3,000, much, much earlier in that life cycle, we would stop these kids from getting into social justice. So this case for prevention and early intervention is very, very strong. So what are we seeing in Australia? I've presented this robust evidence from a science point of view and an economic point of view. Uh, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing worsening child outcomes. Fiona Stanley said uh, a number of years ago that this is the first generation of children who are worse off than previous generations. And we're seeing this uh, in physical health, in mental health, increasing rates of child abuse and neglect, poor academic achievement, social adjustment, et cetera, et cetera. You all know about the AEDC, which used to be the AEDI, the Australian Early De Developmental Census. Anybody in the audience is not aware of what this is? Great. Um, so in Australia, in this first uh, world, high income, prosperous country, more than one in five kids is arriving at school already vulnerable or in trouble. And we now have three waves of data and the, and the, the results have barely moved. So we're sort of habituated to the fact that this is the norm. And in some communities, it's every second child. In some indigenous communities, it's even higher than that. So in this photograph of a bright um, uh, prep class, bright uh, five-year-old starting school, you can see the tear in the photo. Those kids to the right-hand side of the tear are heading for trouble. And if you look at um, child abuse notifications, it's gone up year after year after year. And not, I'm not a child abuse expert, but uh, the number of substantiations has just gone up incrementally. And that says to me that lots of families are stressed or in trouble and not doing as good a job raising their children as they'd like to. Um, so uh, in 2014-15, we have over 300,000 notifications in Australia. And if you look at out-of-home care, these are Victorian data now, you can see the number of placements for these young children in out-of-home care. But these are data that really concern me. If you look at uh, the age group, the first column there, the age group zero to four, 23% um, of these out-of-home placements have had three to five different placements in those early years before the children turned four. And the research tells us clearly that what young kids need at that time is stability and consistency and predictability. 
And here are the kids in the most vulnerable time of their brain development being moved from one home to another, to another, to another. And you, you can imagine then how this disrupts brain architecture, disrupts the foundations, and these kids are then heading for trouble later in life. And then mental health. Child mental health is the elephant in the room. Every discussion, every policy discussion I have in many jur jurisdictions, not just in Australia but overseas as well, child mental health comes up. So these are data from 2015 from a national uh, study using sound methodology. Almost one in seven Australian children were assessed as having a mental disorder. So that's well over half a million kids in Australia have mental health problems. We also know from the research that social inequality or disadvantage has a major impact uh, on uh, outcomes. Um, and that has a major impact, particularly in those early years, and it's mediated through this stress response that I was mentioning before. Any adversity operating in that child's environment, stress hormones go up, and when they persist, when they're toxic, because they persist at a high level, that interferes with brain architecture. Uh, and these are kids and families who experience what I call double jeopardy. These are children who would benefit the most from going to high quality childcare and preschool and are the least likely to go. And these are families that would get the most out of accessing social supports and are the least likely to attend. So if you look at the right hand side of this graph, the light blue column there, um, you can see smoking rates during pregnancy, huge difference between low SES, that is disadvantaged families and higher, that's then reflected in low birth weight babies. So this starts, adversity starts in utero. And these are data from the longitudinal study of Australian children. You can see from about the age of three or four years of age, uh, in some instances a bit uh, earlier than that, for social emotional difficulties, communication skills, vocab, emergent literacy, you can see systematic differences begin to emerge between advantaged and disadvantaged populations. And you remember what I said before about the plasticity of the brain decreases as you get older and it gets harder and harder to change. By the time these kids are three or four, these trajectories are harder and harder to change. They become more and more entrenched. And then by the time these kids get to school, those pathways are well and truly established. And you can see for all the domains of the AEDC, there are uh, social class disadvantages. So what we're expecting schools to do is to compensate for what's happened in the five years before children get to school. And it's an impossible task. It's really challenging because of, the, of what we know about brain development research. Those trajectories become harder and harder to change. Uh, Heckman says the best way to, to change the schools to achieve better educational outcomes is to change the conditions under which uh, children are raised in the years before the kids get to school. Um, and this is the, the, the um, uh, double jeopardy that I was talking about before. The most disadvantaged kids who would get the most from going to preschool are the least likely to go. And then again, this is the relationship between uh, adversity and mental health problems. You can see if you uh, earn, if the family earns less than $52,000 a year, you've got a much higher chance of having children with mental health problems. So why aren't we doing better? This is the, the glass half empty. Well, uh, Keating and Hertzman in their seminal book, Developmental Health and the Wealth of Nations, uh, coined the term modernity's paradox, and I quote, we are witness to dramatic expansion of market-based economies whose capacity for wealth generation is awesome. This is 1999. At the same time, there is a growing perception of substantial threats to the health and well-being of today's children and youth in the very societies that benefit most from this abundance. That's 18 years ago. You can reflect on how much worse it's got uh, since then. And then David Green in this uh, lovely quote, it's not as if we've lost the knowledge of what has constituted a good childhood, but it seems more difficult to realise it in the context of rapid change. And we have limited ways of protecting, understanding, monitoring and controlling 
the impact of progress on children. Shared cultural, political and moral commitments to children are becoming confused, contested and weakened in the face of the unstoppable changes, disruptions and uncertainty. So we've, we've termed this, or this has been termed social climate change. We're seeing really rapid change, which seems to be gathering momentum over the past decade. The demographics of families, the social conditions under which children are reared uh, have changed and are changing extreme, extreme, extremely rapidly. And we're all aware of this from, just from the media. And that has a major impact on children and families. So families that are well resourced do fine. As our Prime Minister said last year, there's never been a more exciting time to be alive if you've got the resources and education and the capacity, capacity in a family to take advantage of that. But we know that lots of families don't. And that's been reflected worldwide with uh, Trump. <laughs> it took me 15 minutes to say that word. Um, Brexit. La Pen, there's lots of families that are left behind the social change and we're seeing the uh, ramifications of that. So this creates real challenges for all of us, for researchers, for policymakers, for professionals, for parents and families. There are no silver bullets to fixing these sorts of issues. These have been called wicked problems, so interventions are complex. Hard to evaluate interventions. Um, and one of the challenges for all of us is that prevention and early intervention is invisible. We can't touch it, we can't feel it, so therefore it's less attractive to governments and to ministers. There's no plaques on the side of buildings, there's no photo opportunities, um, and it's long term. We see that it's very, very hard for us to argue with the government of the day that um, the way to decrease the number of kids in social justice is to invest in the first three years of life because uh, that's a 10, 15, 20 year time frame. Um, it's hard to get the language right um, and there's a suspicion in Australia of government, the nanny state, and there's also a suspicion of science. You know, I get accused, we, my colleagues get accused of you ivory tower academics, what would you know? So this is very, very challenging for all of us. H.L. Mencken says, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And that's the difficulty, taking these really complex concepts, complex issues, and simplifying it without making them simple. We're, we've seen and we are seeing a fragmentation of advocacy and policies and services. So um, there's a, a fragmentation of advocacy. There are so many different stakeholders who are passionate about issues and topics that are relevant to children and families. Um, there are advocates for children, advocates for parents, uh, others like the environment, climate change. There's no single voice and we end up competing with each other. So when the steel lobby or the industries lobby or the oil lobby comes to Canberra and advocates for whatever they want, they're on the one page governments know exactly what they want. And I may not always get it, but there's clarity in what they want. When we come to Canberra, there's 4,000 of us, and each of us has got a little different sort of an agenda. So I'm quite sympathetic to governments who just throw their hands up in despair, and it's just too hard and too complicated. So we can't get on the same page. There's fragmentation of public policy. There's vertical fragmentation between different levels of government, Commonwealth, state, local government, there's horizontal fragmentation, not just between different government departments, but within departments as well. There's fragmentation by age. Uh, there are different targets. And then there's fragmentation of services. If we go into communities, all but the most remote communities in Australia, there's a proliferation of services um, from different government departments, Commonwealth services, state government services, local government services, for-profit, philanthropic, church groups, et cetera, et cetera. It really is a bit of a mess. So again, if you go into most communities in Australia, there's a, this bewildering array of funded services. You need 
a tertiary degree to negotiate your way around those services. And we're dealing with some of the most vulnerable families. This is a complex slide. This is the work we did in an area not far from our centre in Melbourne, tracking the journey of a child through health, education, welfare at a state level. Very complex, referrals needed, waiting lists, barriers, transport issues, et cetera, et cetera. And this is work we did in Dufton, which is a disadvantaged community about an hour's drive from Melbourne. We actually mapped all the services in that community. And look how little those services interact with each other. So we could conclude that the last thing Dovton needs is more services. They need glue to glue together those existing services. Do we need a different approach? Well, I would argue yes, although it's not that simple. Um, science doesn't give us the answer to everything, but if we look to science, it gives us some answers. Um, and I would argue we've got a very strong academic leadership in this country around early childhood issues and family issues. Science will give us some of these answers. Um, we have to be careful not to overpromise because then reality hits us. Tackling wicked problems is an evolving art. They require thinking that is capable of grasping the big picture, including the interrelationships among the full range of causal factors underlying them. They often require broader, more collaborative and innovative approaches. So we're very pleased in the to see in the last few years more and more emphasis on using evidence, more and more evidence on looking to science. And so you'll be hearing and discussing the use of evidence-based programs. There are a couple of flaws though. One is the assumption that if a program has been shown to work in another jurisdiction, if it's been published, that it's going to work in this particular community and it's going to work over a long period of time. And the assumption that you can take something that's been reported in the States or Canada or the UK with 100 families or 200 families, import it into Australia without adjustment and it'll work here. Uh, it, if only that was the case. So people talk about program fidelity. If we take something off the shelf that's been shown to work somewhere else, and implement it here and it doesn't work. The implication is it doesn't work because we haven't implemented it in the way that it was supposed to have been implemented. That's called program fidelity. And up until fairly recently, that's all people are interested in, making sure that you implement the program the way it's supposed to. We argue that what we're missing is two other types of fidelity. One is the process, is process fidelity, how you implement that. And second, values fidelity, making sure it's consistent with client values. In other words, how services are delivered are just as important, if not more important, than what is delivered. So we have to move away from these checklists and ticking the boxes, et cetera, towards relationships. And if you look at the uh, counselling and therapy literature, it seems that what's more important than the type of therapy, whether it's psychotherapy or gestalt or CBT, or what it happens to be, the critical thing is the quality of the relationship that a therapist has with their client. And we believe it's the same with early childhood services. The other issue is uh, the approach we have for families. So traditionally what we've done is identified a family or a group of families or a community as having problems. It's sort of been top down. The challenge of that is not all families um, sign up to that. Not all families uh, will resonate with you saying to them they've got problems. So we think that a needs-based approach needs to be introduced as well, where um, on the basis of relationships that we have with families, we work with them in helping them figure out what they need then to achieve those particular outcomes. And ideally, we should have a combination of both. So how can we do better? Well, here's a suggested framework, and this is very challenging work. Uh, as Don Berwick says, nothing hard is ever easy. So this um, saying is sort of thrown around a lot, but there's a lot of truth in that. It takes a village to raise a child. I like this quote, what the best and wisest parent want for his own child must be what the community wants for all children. So children grow up in families, families live in communities. What is it about some families where parents don't raise children in the way that they would like to? And how can we improve that? 
And what, what is it about some communities that don't provide the support to families to uh, get them to parent in a better way? And once we find that out, then that gives us a solution as what to do. So if we were to start all over again from scratch, if there was a greenfield site out there, how would we design a system to better support families and build capacity in communities? So the principles are we can't focus only on the child or only on the parents. Um, we would argue that you need to build the capacity of families and communities. So you give a, a person a fish eats for a day, teach them to fish, they eat for a lifetime. So building capacity also provides the best chance of sustainability. And we need to start thinking about how we can best change the conditions under which young children grow up, supporting parents, building those connections between families, because we know that social isolation is a major risk factor, make the system accessible and easy to navigate. A one-size-fits-all approach from the top is most unlikely to work because every community is different from every other. And I like this notion of what we call tight, loose controls, where if you go into a community now and you roll up or map all of the programs and services and funds that go there, there's scores of them often. And the research would suggest to us that we should roll all of those up and give the communities a single check on the basis that they know better than we how to achieve those outcomes. So tight, loose controls means that governments are very tight on outcomes. We'll give you this money, we'll hold you responsible for achieving an increase in this and a decrease in that. But loose on inputs on the basis that the community can figure out how to use those resources in a way that achieves those outcomes. The closer you are to the action, the greater the chance you'll know how to achieve those outcomes. Um, when, we, when there's a simple cause and effect, we have a person-based approach. And in medicine, that's the classic one. We take a diagnosis, we take a history, do an examination, do some tests, come up with a diagnosis, and you treat the person. For wicked problems, that doesn't work, or doesn't, it often doesn't work because of the complexity of all those pathways. So for these sorts of conditions, we argue you need a place-based approach. And place is really building a profile of that community. What do we know about the children and the families in this particular community? What do the data show? What assets are available? Not just services, but what are the assets and the strengths of that particular community? What does a service system look like now? Is it accessible? How hard is it to access? What data are available in that community to inform our planning? And in our experience, data are a very powerful way of engaging with stakeholders in the community. Then we work with communities to implement those changes. So we move away from this individual person approach, this reactive individual approach, towards a population prevention approach, where we look at the whole population of a particular community. Complex social issues cannot be dealt with merely by interventions with children, or by strengthening families, or by building community capacity. Policy needs an integrated focus on all three elements, children, families, and communities. So complex interventions of the sort we're talking about, uh, in, uh, according to PLACE, um, aim to change systems, as I mentioned before. Um, hard to measure because some, some of these uh, differences are pretty subtle. Uh, it's all about relationships. Um, and rather than just rely on randomized controlled trials, which take a year to establish, a year to get funding, three years to get the results, then yeah, we can't afford that time anymore. So what's sort of hot in the evaluation literature is what we call rapid cycle reviews, where we, we're getting feedback all of the time. We implement a promising approach. Um, we set up systems of data and evaluation as we go. We're getting feedback in real time, and we're modifying our intervention as we go along. So as I said before, how is just as important as what? Um, let me just rush through the last few slides. So uh, the service system, we would argue that the way to approach the service system is not to target, because target is stigmatizing, 
it's often lower quality. It's often been said that services for the poor tend to be poor services. And if we focus only on disadvantaged communities, we actually miss most children who have got problems because there's many, many children in middle class um, families. So we really like the idea of uh, universal services, strengthening the universal service system. And one of the advantages we have in Australia is that of a very strong and generally accessible universal service system. And these provide soft entry points. Kids go to childcare, preschool, school, they go to community nurses, they go to GPs, they're non-stigmatising. So Michael Marmot talks about proportionate universalism. Focusing solely on the most disadvantaged will not reduce health inequality sufficiently. To reduce the steepness of the social gradient in health, actions must be universal, but with a scale and intensity proportionate to the level of disadvantage. In other words, every child, every family gets that universal basket of services. Then you add on to those universal services uh, all that a child and family needs proportionate to their need. We call that universal plus. So, as I said, we strengthen the universal service system. We map the secondary and tertiary services and identify the referral pathways. So everybody, every professional in a community, we engage in early identification, early referral. So if I'm a preschool teacher or a childcare worker, um, I'm not trained clinically. I'm just trained in education um, or early learning, but I can sense because I see you day after day, there's something not quite right going on. And I leverage off the trusted relationship I have with a parent to say, look, it seems as if something da 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 da, would you like help with that? And if we know the community, then we've got those referral pathways. So I don't know what's going on with you, there's something not quite right. I will refer you to somebody who can sort things out and I'll take responsibility for making sure you keep that referral. So we need more glue rather than more programs. And so one of the challenges is, from a policy and resource allocation point of view, what does it take to glue services together? And again, it will look different in different communities because the leadership is different, the demographic is different, the configuration of services is different. Um, and how can we create a virtual one-stop shop? So instead of this uh, fragmentation, uh, Everywhere that a child and family make contact with the service system, you've, you've come to the right place. There are no wrong doors everywhere. So this is what we aim to do. If we did nothing, we know that lots of children would fall away because of biological and environmental risk. We want all children to fulfil their potential. Um, and it's not as if we don't invest. We do. Our glass is half full. But we're at that sort of red line. But at least in theory, we can lift children from that red line to the green line. And that's the opportunity we have as a society, as a country, uh, from a policy point of view. The key to success is simple, make people dream. And I just want to finish with this. It's the burden on good leadership to make the currently unthinkable thinkable, to question the obvious, to make the present systems unavailable as options for the future. The boundaries in our minds create fear about the consequences of crossing over to the undiscovered country. But the possibilities we really need do not lie on this side of our mental fences. Once crossed, these fences will look as foolish in retrospect as the beliefs of other times now often look to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Oberclade, for what I think was a very inspirational uh, presentation. You did mention about looking at things from the glass half full perspective, but I think you've also given us a lot of ideas for how we can consider work that might address some of those things, which is always great. Um, let me next introduce Professor Keith Kaufman, who is Professor of Psychology at Portland State University in the United States. Professor Kaufman has provided assessment and treatment to child sexual abuse victims and juvenile sexual offenders, as well as their families. 
He provides regular training and consultation focused on prevention and enhancing safety in organisational settings. In 2016, he completed with Marcus Aruga a comprehensive review of the international literature on risk and protective factors related to child sexual abuse in institutions for the Australian Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Today, he will present on using the situational prevention approach to foster child safe organisations. Welcome. Good morning. I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. I'm very excited about being here with you today and having a chance to talk a little bit about the situational prevention approach, which is actually an approach that's intended to shift the dialogue from youth serving organizations dealing with child harms after the fact to more of a focus on prevention. In the brief time that I have with you, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the critical need for enhancing prevention efforts in youth serving organizations or YSOs, and then introduce the situational prevention approach. As Chris mentioned, I had the good fortune to work on a, a Royal Commission project uh, that was entitled Risk Profiles for Institutional Child Sexual Abuse, a Literature Review with a colleague from the UK, Marcus Aruga, and also Associate Professor Daryl Higgins from the Australian Catholic University, as well as some of my graduate students. I want to tell you a little bit about that study and a little bit about our findings. Uh, we were able to review the literature from the US, Australia, and the UK. We summarized and critiqued the pertinent articles, and our focus was on risk and protective factors related to victims perpetrators, and institutional areas. Um, we were also able to suggest some recommendations from what we found. I have to admit we were quite surprised. Uh, we found over 400 reports and articles, mostly made up of published articles. And what we did was we characterized those articles into five areas based on the type of sector that they represented. Faith-based, early childhood education in schools, healthcare, out-of-home care, and sports. And you may not be surprised to hear that we found a great deal on risk factors. We found almost nothing on protective factors, sadly. Let me spend just a few minutes talking about some of the findings uh, based on each of those risk areas. So first, victim risks. Uh, as we all know, children spend a significant amount of their time in, involved with various youth serving organizations. For example, in Australia, uh, more than 74% of Australian uh, 15 to 17 year, year olds are involved in sport. A slightly smaller number are involved in sport in the US, and there's more than 50 million children who attend school every day in the US. Our findings suggest that females, children from low socioeconomic status families, and younger children were at the greatest risk for child sexual abuse. Also at risk were, were children from underrepresented groups and those with disabilities. And we also found that parents' difficulties contributed to children's risk. So for example, parents with mental, mental illness issues, substance abuse, and legal problems uh, seem to increase the risk of their children for child sexual abuse. With regard to perpetrator risks, uh, there was no prototypic profile of a YSO perpetrator, and that's not surprising. That's consistent with the literature uh, for other types of domains. But there was quite a bit in the way of suggestions that we've known about for a while uh, with regard to risk factors, uh, such things as deviant sexual interests all the way through poor self-management. And there was a balance reflected in the literature of those offenders who we would call preferential offenders, and pedophiles fall into that category, but also some offenders that seem much more opportunistic, taking taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of particular youth-serving organizations to offend. 
The literature also brought up a group of perpetrators that really hasn't been dealt with very much in the literature and I think is really important for us to think about with regard to youth serving organizations. If you think of it, every youth serving organization has powerful individuals. They all have board members, CEOs, administrative staff, donors, and in some cases, they even have celebrities that are attached to them. Part of what we found, particularly from the inquiries from around the world and case studies, is that these particular offenders, when powerful individuals offend, their modus operandi or patterns of perpetration look different. Typically, they tend to have unprecedented access to children. Policies, rules, and supervision may not apply to them at all. And if their contributions are significant, either monetarily or in terms of status, um, the the organization may be their oyster, if you will, and there's little that there is in terms of current barriers. And while each of our countries have such offenders, I think that the poster child, if you will, for this is the UK's Sir, Jim, Sir Jimmy Savile. If you don't know about him, he was a TV and radio star, literally a friend to the Queen and a major fundraiser for a variety of hospitals. He's considered to be the most prolific UK offender of all time with up to and perhaps more than 1,000 victims over his 40 years. He offended in multiple youth serving organizations and also in the BBC studios while he was producing his shows. And despite the fact that there are hundreds of reports of people viewing and experiencing different inappropriate and perhaps illegal behaviors, he was never charged in his lifetime. So for me, this is an area that we need to attend to and be more mindful of and incorporate into our prevention. With regard to organizational risks, one of the striking findings was the fact that we clearly have an over-reliance on background checks. If you look at the research information, less than 5% of new offenders have any type of criminal history. So that means that the, that the, the greatest effort that we incorporate uh, typically in youth serving organization background checks at best will yield 4 to 5%. We also found that there was a lack of clearly defined child safety policies and inadequate attention to situational risks that I'm going to talk more about. And when I say situational risks, what I'm talking about is environmental factors, risky situations, daily and routine activities that our children who are involved in these organizations uh, participate in, their families and the staff, and then also policies. Our findings also suggested that there are issues with organizational culture and a lack of a proactive commitment to safety cultures. And in some cases, there are policies that are missing. In other cases, the policies are there, but the orientation doesn't allow staff or volunteers to know what those policies are. Finally, we took a look across these different sectors, and what we found was that there were some risk factors that were specific to sector, for example, one-to-one -one medical exams that increased risk, but there were also many more that were common across settings, for example, poorly enforced supervision policies. We also found that uh, offenders most often capitalize on existing opportunities and vulnerabilities within the YSO. And this is significant because what this says to us is if we tighten up these gaps, we're going to create much safer environments to protect our children. Also hopeful is the fact that we found that offender grooming or modus operandi or patterns of perpetration is often visible to people. And if we can help them understand what they're looking at and let them know what to do, we can greatly increase prevention opportunities. Finally, I thought it was particularly significant that most of this literature is very siloed. So the information in the sports literature, as opposed to education literature, as opposed to healthcare literature, very rarely crosses over, which I think is problematic because there's a lot to learn across these sectors, and I think we need to move towards working on that to a greater degree in the future. So Malcolm Forbes said the best vision is insight, and as an outsider to your fine country, I have to give a lot of credit to what Australia's done. I think that you've had an exceptional vision with regard to thinking about these issues. Your commitment to royal commissions, although I think at times there's a little bit of royal commission fatigue. Um, I actually saw an article recently that, that talked about royal commissions, yes, but what are we doing next? Um, 
you've spent a lot of time with royal commissions and it's yielded a great deal of basic information to truly understand what the issues are and what the needs and i think that's fabulous you've also attended to a lot of vulnerable populations you've incorporated a strong evidence base and you've adopted at the state level standards which is really uh, remarkable i also know that you're working towards a national plan to create some consistency so you deserve an awful lot of credit and i think when you look across the world as we did with our literature review you really find that what's happening here is part of the leading edge uh, of safety and protective factors in ysos at the same time there's always more that we can be doing and i think in some ways it's a fairly simple formula I think we need good process. I think we need to be sure we're focused on the right content. We need to make sure that the policies strengthen the practice and that we use evaluation as a feedback loop to, to learn better what's working and what needs to be improved. Some of the key critical areas I think we should pursue is better employee and volunteer screening. And I don't mean more background checks. I mean better interviewing, better referencing. I think we need more comprehensive training on safety issues, uh, especially at the, uh, the frontline level for staff. We need well-designed and consistently implemented policies. We need to enhance supervision, both the supervision of our staff and our volunteers, as well as supervision of our children. I think one of the lost links in all of this are the natural gatekeepers. I think we need to do more to incorporate parents into this process and make them collaborators in our efforts. I think we need to work on creating a more positive organizational climate and also uh, focusing more attention on situational risks that have not been attended to uh, sufficiently. I also think that for, for all the good things that there are some particular challenges that, that Australia and your efforts uh, face. First off, the breadth of different types of YSO programs is uh, a great deal to deal with. You need something that cuts across them, but also uh, acknowledges the differences in those different sectors. The huge number of programs that would be expected to meet safety needs is also a challenge, particularly starting off with limited resources to meet those standards, limited consultation and support personnel. I also think that it's important at the level of YSOs to work on buy-in and enhancing st staff capacity to be able to enhance prevention. And again, I think it's worth repeating. I think we need to do more to incorporate parents into our process as collaborators to strengthen prevention. So before telling you a little bit about the situational prevention approach, I'd like to give you my perspective on what an ideal prevention approach would look like. I think it would need to be comprehensive. So while we spend a lot of effort focusing, as we should, on the prevention of child sexual abuse, I think there are a lot of other harms that can befall children while involved in YSOs. That can be neglect, that can be um, physical type of abuse, it can be health-related concerns, it can be peer-to-peer -peer kinds of issues. I think all of those need to be incorporated into our schemes for creating safer environments. The one thing that we know about prevention is, is it works really well. Typically, evidence suggests it works great until the day after funding ends. So I think our programs need to be sustainable. They need to be either low cost or no cost. They need to be doable. They need to be easy to complete for the organizations we expect to implement them. And I also think that prevention at the same time needs to respond to the complexity of the organization uh, that we expect to embed it. I'd also argue that we need to think about dynamic factors when we think about prevention. It needs to be adaptable to different organizational goals, and it must be tailored to the individual needs of each site. We need to incorporate a grassroots movement. There's incredible expertise in youth serving organizations. There's expertise and experience of staff, and that needs to be taken advantage of in prevention. We need to also respond to organizational change over time and the dynamic nature of youth serving organizations. And perhaps most importantly, it needs to be practical. It needs to identify local risks that each of the youth serving organizations are struggling with and come up with doable, effective, and affordable solutions. I'd also say that what we're looking for is a more dynamic prevention process to complement what exists, which 
in many regards were a lot of what I would call fixed prevention approaches. Let me just take a moment and try to better define those two dimensions for you because I think they're important. When I say fixed prevention approaches, I'm talking about approaches that we have that are focused on a single or a few risk areas. So examples might be computer safety or children's kitchen safety if you incorporate food preparation into, into what you do uh, in your organization. Uh, this type of approach uh, focuses on the same risks each time. They uh, incorporate the same solutions each time. And for me, it's one of those times where one size fits all is okay because it's very narrow, very focused. We know these things work and they're great. They should be a part of all of our youth serving organizations. But at the same time, I think what we're looking for is a much more broad based complement to that. Um, something that has the goal of identifying all critical risks in a particular youth serving organization site at a given moment in time. We're talking about something that has the ability to identify different risks in each particular setting and not assuming that they're the same. And opens up to us the possibility of a broad range of solutions to increase the effectiveness of our prevention efforts. And that the solutions are tailored specifically to each need of each specific setting. We do have these broad models, so I would argue that even our familiarity with general problem solving is, in the, is an example of a very dynamic prevention model. And the situational prevention approach that I'm about to tell you about, I think also falls into this category. I want to remind you in talking about the situational prevention approach that the goal is to shift the focus from dealing with harms after they occur to more of a prevention focus on risks. And when I say sit situational, uh, the focus here is on environmental factors, risky situations, routine and daily activities of children, their families and staff, as well as policies. What we know about this is that situational approaches to prevention are well-rooted, both in evidence-based approaches and in theories. In fact, there's more, of a fit, more than a 50-year history of using situational prevention to create safe housing around the world and a 20 to 25 year positive history of incorporating situational pre uh, prevention approaches into um, creating safe communities. It's only been in the last 10 or 11 years that we've adapted these situational prevention approaches for use in addressing sexual violence. In fact, Stephen Smallbone and Richard Wortley uh, from Griffith University um, did a book in 2006 that was intended to apply situational prevention to sexual violence. We were fortunate enough to write a chapter for that. And it's even been more recent that we've thought about using situational prevention specifically in youth ser serving organizations and pairing it with the prevention of child sexual abuse. The approach that I want to tell you about is by design very simple. It's simple to make it sustainable. It's simple to make it uh, a process that would cut across different types of sectors and different types of programs. It's four steps. The first step is risk brainstorming. The second is solution development. The third is prioritizing risk solution pairs. And the fourth is creating simple impl implementation plans and taking action. The front end of this, the risk brainstorming is critically important. It's very simple. If we don't put risks on the table, we don't have the chance to address them and to create solutions. What we found is that uh, we're using a group of eight risk prompts that I'll tell you about in a minute, and they seem to do a good job with youth serving organizations to get people thinking about and identifying and working towards what we hope is identifying as many risks for a particular site as possible for a given moment in time. This approach offers elements of risk assessment, strengths and protective factor, identification, and also preventive intervention. And again, it, it fosters uh, the development of tailored prevention or risk reduction solutions uh, that, are, that are specifically for each particular setting. So let me give you a little bit more detail so you have a better feel for the four steps. The first step, as I mentioned, is brainstorming to identify risks. And again, this is a view from 30,000 feet. It's intended to be 30 miles wide and an inch deep and help us identify as many risks as possible within a given organization. It's intended to help us avoid 
you seeing this from the ground level when this is what you really should see? Or seeing this when we absolutely want you not to miss that? So what we're talking about with risk brainstorming is a strong strategy for getting the big picture in youth serving organizations. We use three different groups to try to get different perspectives. We use a YSO or youth serving organization administrative and staff work group to identify risks. We ask parents in, these are the parents of the participants and we wanna get their perspective on risks. We also have found it very useful to ask teenagers to participate. And I will tell you that both the parent group and the teenager group yield risks that don't come up oftentimes with the staff and the administrators. Where possible, we also include board members from the YSO and key community uh, stakeholders. I mentioned that there were eight different risk prompts. Five of them uh, pertain very specifically to the youth serving organization. They include at-risk youth, and that's about the youth themselves, for example, a youth perhaps with developmental delays, but it's also about their parents. So it might be a parent that has substance abuse problems and the impact that that has on the youth. Or it could even be a parent who's a wonderful parent, but works two jobs and as a result, isn't around very much to supervise. We also ask them to generate risks around high risk locations within the organization and on the grounds outside. And then we ask them to generate risks about something we call facilitators, which aren't risks in and of themselves, but something that causes a bloom of risk. So if you'll notice in this picture, you have a staff member uh, or a volunteer who's looking at their phone while they should be supervising children. If that's allowed throughout the day, that creates that bloom of risks throughout the day of when somebody should be attending directly to the child, but maybe is distracted. We also ask um, our participants to generate risks about safety climate and policies, as well as health, accident prevention, and physical safety while at the facility. There are three community-based prompts that we ask them to generate risks for. The first is community safety and climate and policies. So if, for example, your youth serving organization takes children to a community pool, you inherit the risks that belong to that pool. We ask them to generate risks as well about lifestyle and routine activities of the children, the families, and the staff. Here, for example, you might have issues with a child walking home alone, uh, particularly if the neighborhood isn't a comfortable one or maybe if it's late in the evening. And finally, we ask them to talk about the community context. For example, one of the Boys and Girls Club uh, centers that we worked with, 40% of the buildings that surrounded it were abandoned. And um, you want to guess where children played uh, or the shortcuts that they took were always through these buildings. They were, they were very enthralling to the children, but not very safe. So here with this first step with brainstorming risks, very clearly it leads to the ability to come up with prevention solutions. I want to point out that if we use this with multiple settings that are part of an organization, it offers us another dimension. It offers us the ability to look across these facilities for patterns of risk that may lead us to policy change, to the creation of best practice guidelines, and also to uh, resource development. And there's a third level. If we look across organizations within a sector, it may give us the ability to advocate and educate legislators, as well as maybe encourage them to pass laws uh, or create policies that increase um, youth safety. So we have these risks identified now, and in the second step, we're gonna come up with solutions for each risk. These risks, um, these risk solutions, I should say, need to be realistic, they need to be cost-effective, they need to be doable, and they need to be effective themselves. Uh, we ask um, our organizations to try to build on their, their existing strengths and protective factors, and where that's enough, we support them in creating new strategies. We give priority to prevention, and when prevention is impossible, we suggest risk reduction strategies. Uh, for example, a prevention strategy, a very simple one might be if you have building access issues, a lot of doors in a building that are hard to monitor, uh, the simple step of locking or locking and alarming doors and forcing everyone through the front door past reception uh, is a, a preventive intervention that if you keep those doors locked, that risk shouldn't come up again. 
In contrast, if you have open houses or you have evening events where you invite the community, that may increase the risk. It may be hard to use prevention with that, but we might use a risk reduction solution where we ask everyone to sign in and wear a name tag. And while we haven't ameliorated all the risks, we've given a clear signal that we know who you are, we're paying attention, and hopefully that reduces the risk. In the third step, we take risk solution pairs and we prioritize them. We prioritize them based on cost, capacity, and resources, as well as the degree of concern that we have about the particular risk. We literally ask and help support organizations sort these risk solution pairs into two piles. One of solutions that are relatively easy to implement, perhaps the example I gave about locking doors, and those that are more challenging, the example about addressing the evening open house. In the final step, what we go ahead and do is create simple implementation plans and take action. We ask our, our, our youth serving organizations to work on five issues at a time. And you may ask why five? Well, I would ask you to raise your hand if you currently work on one thing at a time. I don't think anyone in the world does anymore. Five seems doable. We ask them to always use the formula of taking three of the items off the relatively easy to solve list that's prioritized, two from the more challenging. And what that does is it creates movement. So they are solving problems while they're working on those more difficult ones. I'll show you in just a moment an example of a simple implementation plan. They literally take as little as five minutes. It might take 15 or 20 minutes uh, to create. We also ask them to think about whether or not there are any policies that need to be adjusted based on these solutions. And we ask folks to think about repeating this process at least once a year, if not more often. Why? Two reasons. One is these organizations are very dynamic. The children change. The populations you serve change. Your staff changes. Uh, sometimes the programs you offer change, and sometimes even the buildings change. So it's important to repeat this process. The second reason is if a risk comes up after you've instituted a solution, it's a clear message to us that we need to revisit that solution, come up with something stronger. So here, as I mentioned, is an example of a uh, simple implementation plan. In the first column, the risk is the large number of unknown adults in the building when there's organized sports that are going on outside. The prevention strategy is to only allow children into the building at those times and restrict use of the bathrooms and the phones. The steps to accomplish that begin with creating the, uh, a policy with youth and other key informant input, sending that information out that there'll be a policy change to uh, families, distributing flyers, posting signs, training staff how to politely but firmly implement the policy, and then when it's time to implement the policy, putting signs up, closing the doors, having someone monitor that. You'll notice in the columns that follow, it specifies who's responsible for each step, who's supervising this process, what costs are involved with each step, what resources might be brought to bear, when the steps are due to be completed, and whether or not there's a need for policy modification. We've used this in a number of settings, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, we did this in a three-plus year pilot project with Boys and Girls Club of America. Uh, and if you don't know of this program, and you may not, I'm not sure that you have Boys and Girls Clubs here, uh, their mission is to enable all young people, especially those who need us most, to reach their full potential as productive, caring, responsible citizens. They have more than 4,000 clubs across the US. And this was a three-year project that was funded by the Pennsylvania um, uh, uh, Coalition Against Rape. And there were two phases. The first phase was a phase to adapt this approach to their culture and practice. And with that, we worked with seven clubs in two different states. And the second was a strengthening phase. And we worked with four clubs, uh, I'm sorry, 16 clubs across four states. The preliminary findings are very promising. And again, there's a strong research base for, for um, uh, situational prevention. This is about learning about applying this in youth serving organizations. So these are resource depleted organizations, if you will. Uh, they don't have a lot of the way of resources and yet. We found when we collected information from all of the participants that they were uh, pretty satisfied with it, between satisfied and very satisfied. We also took a little bit of a look at what this generated. 
And as I told you, that front end of generating risks is critical. And we found that going from a pretest, which is before implementing this approach, to implementing it, we had a 12-fold increase in the identification of risks, which is a little scary if you think about it. It means if you're not doing anything, you're missing the vast majority of risks. Um, I should also say that for each risk that was identified, a solution was created. And within relatively short order, these clubs uh, put those solutions into practice. Um, when we compared clubs uh, in the same cities that were either using the situational prevention approach or business as usual, there were 10 times as many risks, 10 times as many risks identified with using situational prevention. And I, it's always interesting how you find out more about your process. Um, the fourth state, when we, um, when we added that in, we discovered that they didn't follow the directions very well. And we found how important that was. So um, if you take a look here, what happens is, is you still get a seven time increase in the number of risks identified, but it becomes really clear that if you don't include enough participants in the process, you don't get the same yield of risks that are identified. So in concluding, I want to say that we've used this with a number of different kinds of organizations, uh, done consultation with, with two major metropolitan ch children's hospitals that discovered they had child sexual offenders in their midst. And we used this to look at what um, uh, safety gaps there are and how those can be closed. We've used it as a mechanism, the front part, uh, as a risk identification process with individual boys and girls clubs. It's been used for about a half dozen years in Thailand with faith-based organizations. Uh, we've collected some information from teachers about what risks are, and we're about to do a national rollout with Boys and Girls Clubs of America to address their 4,000 settings to make this available to them. I'm really excited to tell you that we're about halfway through a three-year million dollar development project to take this approach and tailor it for use on U.S. colleges and university campuses. And while it's designed specifically to address uh, uh, sexual assault on campus, we're actually broadening it to look at any type of student harm, much in the way that we did here. So Einstein said, intellectual solve problems, geniuses prevent them. I want to encourage you to focus even more on prevention. Go off, be a genius, and feel free to be in contact if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Kaufman. Um, when I saw you in Brisbane, I mentioned that your presentation's so particularly relevant to work the department's doing with the uh, National Children's uh, Commissioner on a statement of principles for child safe organisations. But I think in terms of a, an exemplar of how you can approach risk management in any situation, and particularly noting many in the room deal with programs deal with families and children, you know, this is really timely presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I now welcome to the stage Professor Bridget Daniel, who is a Professor of Social Work and Director of the Centre for Child Wellbeing and Protection in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Stirling in the UK. Professor Daniel is the Academic Advisor to With Scotland, a national hub of expertise based at Stirling University that aims to enhance research and practice in child welfare and protection in Scotland. Today, she will present on Getting It Right for Every Child, Scotland's Framework for Children's Services. Welcome. Hello. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And what a beautiful land it is. This is my first time in Canberra and it's really stunning. And it, it's quite, it's funny to have left an emerging spring and to arrive in an autumn like this. Um, but a very beautiful, beautiful area it is here. So it's a real privilege to have had a chance to come and, and see uh, your lovely surroundings here. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about the national framework in Scotland, which is called uh, Getting It Right for Every Child, or summarised as GERFEC now, so we usually just talk about GERFEC. And 
listening to Frank again speaking about a kind of prescription for what um, a preventive universal approach would look like, actually getting right for every child is trying to move that kind of direction and actually is underpinned by many of the principles uh, that Frank was talking about. I'm not in any shape or form saying that it's perfect and that it's rolling out uh, completely smoothly and everything is fixed, but certainly a general trend and direction which is in congruence with this notion of moving upstream, taking a more universal, non-stigmatizing approach. So I'm going to talk about what the model looks like, uh, elements of the model, but also discuss some of the facilitating processes, uh, but also some of the challenges that it's facing uh, and some of the issues and questions and uh, problems associated with trying to introduce a national approach. So, first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, that some of the thinking for this, this presentation has come from a project that we're working on in, in Stirling, which we call the Seamless Services Project, which is a, a series of three linked PhD projects. Who are all those three students are all looking at uh, the rollout of Gerfec, but they're looking, looking at it from different perspectives. So one's looking at it from the perspective of health, the other from education, one from, and the other from social work. And together, they're looking at the interface between these different disciplines and the extent to which they may be seamless or not. Uh, and this project has been funded by a number of different NGOs, as well as the Health Service and uh, the social, social Work Scotland. So an interesting sort of matrix of funding. And that actually evidence is the extent to which there's a kind of multidisciplinary interest and buy-in to the whole um, getting it right for every child uh, approach in Scotland. And also a colleague, Emma Coles, who's written a very interesting analysis of the getting it right for every child uh, model. Uh, and that's available in a paper that's actually, it's become one of the top downloaded papers from the journal in which it was published, which shows that there's a big international interest in attempts to have a countrywide approach. I suppose we should acknowledge, of course, that Scotland's very small uh, compared with Australia, both ge geographically and with numbers of people. So we're in a country where everybody kind of knows each other and everybody's interconnected. Although I do find when I come to Australia, it does seem as if you all know each other. And I'm always bumping into people I've met before when I come here. So you've got very strong networks as well here, I think, between, between you all. But it's a small country and there's a very close interconnection between um, politicians, policymakers, academics, and the stakeholders, and, and those who are delivering services. Um, so the, that gives you a good sort of basis for developing and taking forward, um, I think, big ideas. So the Gear Effect does represent, a, a, it is an aspirational transformational change program, and it is at a national level. I think that's very important. It is, it's an approach that's been adopted at, at a nation level question of the extent to which Scotland is a nation, of course, is another big contentious issue at the moment, um, because of, in some senses we are a country, but in other senses we're not. So uh, we're still heavily influenced by some of the Westminster policies, in particular the austerity policies, which have a massive effect on Scotland. Um, the Scottish Government has done quite a lot to mitigate the impact of some of these austerity policies uh, from Westminster, but that, of course, comes at a cost. Um, if you're trying to mitigate some of the worst kind of um, welfare cuts. Um, so there are some tensions around trying to do something on a, nas a national basis in a country that doesn't have complete autonomy to do what it would like to do. Um, it aligns with an objective that has been set uh, by the Scottish Government for Scotland to be the best place for children to grow up. So that's pretty ambitious. And some of you might say, well, actually, well, our country is quite good for children to grow up too. So uh, maybe we could start a kind of international competition about which place could be the best one for children to grow up. That would be a, a, a good kind of benign competition to have, I think. Um, it, it, until fairly recently, the Getting Right for Every Child has had all party support. And in fact, it was originally designed under a different um, kind of political uh, set of arrangements. It was a, a coalition, actually, which was Labour Liberal, uh, as opposed to SNP, which we now have. Uh, so there was pretty much all party buy-in. Um, more recently, because politics have become quite hot and contentious, it became quite a useful political football. But for a long period of time, it had pretty much all party buy-in, which was very helpful. And there was cross-party um, committee that was sort of taking some of the ideas forward. 
Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are diverging from England in their social policy, uh, both in adult and child services, but particularly perhaps in, in children's services. Um, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are all trying to go more upstream to focus more on early intervention, prevention, um, family support approaches, whereas England is really moving more and more to residualised um, services and is, is also starting to really look at kind of fragmenting services and uh, um, privatising more, more, more services. So there is a real divergence um, in the UK and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are now being described as a kind of Celtic fringe that are trying to do something a bit different. Very interesting kind of process that's going on um, in the UK at the moment. Whole Brexit, of course, has had a big impact upon all of this as well. Um, and certainly for, for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, leaving um, Europe is not terribly useful. Scotland in particular needs immigration um, and, and, and needs Europe. So there's very interesting wider context. So the, there's a facilitating in context in Scotland for trying to do something uh, in relation to children's well-being and take a well-being approach. Uh, and to work on a kind of more um, integrated approach. So there's, there's been a huge drive towards structural integration of public services. There was a big review of public services, the Christie Commission it was called, which looked at the public services and pushed for far more integration and for budgetary, managerial, operational integration in quite a fundamental way. And there is uh, now um, legislation that has brought together adult health and social care. So they have been legislated to be forced to work uh, more closely together. Children's services in many authorities are also coming into that more integrated approach. So there's been a real push towards integration anyway. And a view that information sharing is kind of underpinning some of that joint working. In relation to children's services, Scotland has always had a different uh, legislative framework for children than uh, the rest of the UK and has its unique children's hearing system, which is a tribunal based approach, which was originally developed primarily for ju youth justice, but is used also for um, care issues as well and for making decisions about where children should reside and whether children come into out of home care. And it is volunteers well, I mean, the trained volunteers, but it's run on a tribunal basis with um, a panel of volunteers from the community to sit and make decisions about uh, disposals for children. Um, and the whole idea of that process was to look at children in the round, to have a welfare-based approach, and in particular in relation to youth justice, it was about a, a model of needs, not deeds, that was introduced. So there was a, an underpinning there of an existing kind of welfare-based approach. There's a huge emphasis on early intervention and, and the early years, and some of this has been rather helpfully led by the now the, the previous chief medical officer in Scotland, who was heavily influenced by some of the material that, that Frank was providing about the benefits of early investment, investment in the early years and the, and the return, social return of investment um, for early intervention. And he has been extraordinarily influential because he had the ear of, of, of politicians and was able to be very convincing of the benefits of um, preventive spend. Uh, and that has really helped to sort of influence political uh, will to move upstream. Uh, there has been quite a long-term aim to shift from a focus on need to a focus on need and to shift from protection to support. Um, and a series of initiatives and policy um, approaches, the, the, the sort of most obvious start of some of this was a review of services for children that was called for Scotland's children, which laid the groundwork for what we have now in terms of um, getting right for every child. And actually, it's worth having a little look at that um, document, so because although it's based in Scotland, it's got some very interesting ideas about how you bring different disciplines together to work collectively um, for the benefit of children. Uh, and they introduce some of the principles that have come through into, get, into getting right for every child. So Scottish government has been very committed to uh, getting right for every child and describes it as the golden thread that knits together policy obje objectives for children and young people. So it's a national framework within which all policies for children should be kind of the, the, the touchstone for. There's also a national, a, a relatively new national curriculum for education called the Curriculum for Excellence, which is shifted towards um, a more holistic approach to children's education with a heavy emphasis on child well-being 
um, and the pastoral element of uh, children's development and resilience. And I mean, that's had a, a, a patchy implementation phase as well, but it's very congruent with the, the getting it right for every child approach. Um, so the, the aspiration is that it's of a support-based um, approach and that it's very much based around well-being of children in a broader sense. So starting from, rather than starting from a deficit risk end, starting from well-being support um, idea and that all of the disciplines work together. So there's a national framework um, which has been developed. Uh, there's a set of outcomes for, that are aspired to for children which are that they are safe, healthy, active, nurtured, uh, or hang on, I've got to get it right, self-healthy, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible, included, now affectionately known as Shinari. We all got sick to death of Shinari because we had mouse mats. Uh, mouse mats seem to have gone out of fashion now, but remember it was mouse mats for uh, laminated Shinaris all over the place. Um, so <laughs> we got bombarded with the Shinaris, um, but actually it's been quite a very quite a helpful sort of framework. It's very evidence-based. It was developed in conjunction with academics and others who had looked at all the, the, the literature on child development to develop these, these, these kind of domains. So it is um, evidence-based and has been a help, helpful sort of framework. And it uh, has been developed for use more actively with children and uh, families. So, for example, in one local authority, they developed what they called the Shinari Star. So they developed a star with each of those um, outcomes on it and all the children when they start school um, are asked to look at that star and locate where they are on for each point and whether they felt they needed some extra help on any of those uh, different domains so they could map it out uh, and it's also used with parents as well so it's been quite a helpful sort of framework for bringing different disciplines together to think about what children need um, the principles are very much around intervention being appropriate, pr proportionate and timely. So the model has been based around a, a concept of pr pr proportionate universalism. If you can even say that, you're doing quite well, I think. Proportionate universalism um, and to be early rather than late. And there has been a massive emphasis and focus in Scotland on early years, but equally there has also been a recognition that early doesn't necessarily have to be always early years, that you have early in the stage of the problem emerging. So there has been recognition of the fact that it's, it's quite often in uh, the teenage years that parents may actually need some help when there's problems emerging at that stage. So it's, it is child focused based on a, a concept of well-being, tackling needs early, services working together and of being universal. And the universal aspect has been its strength, but it's also contributed to some of the problems that is experienced as a model. The model is built around a number of aspects. So as well as the framework, there's also this concept that every child has a named person and that there are also lead professionals when there is a need for more, more than one discipline to be involved. Um, so the named person really is the idea that every child, is there is one person that they can initially go to or looks out for the welfare of the child that the parent can seek help from, they know who to go to. Uh, so initially it would be the midwife. Uh, then we have a, a, pro, a, a pattern of every family having health visitor, that's a public health nurse. Now, there was a period of time where we were reducing and uh, limiting the amount of health visiting support to families and going much more towards targeted. That was shown to be not particularly helpful because as we've heard before, targeting doesn't always particularly work because you often miss people that need, need support. So there's a, a new health visiting um, program that's been developed in Scotland, which entails a um, universal package of home visiting. Um, and we're doing a, a lot of very quick, swift training of health visitors because it's, it's, it's needing that there needs to be more health visitors again, because we're re-moving re back to uh, a more universal service. And so health visitors would be named persons for under fives. And then when children start school, it would be somebody within the school who would become the named person for that child and the first point of contact. 
Um, and then if there is a need for more than one discipline to be involved, there would be a lead professional who would take the lead. The other aspiration is that whatever the child, whatever the need the child has, there would be one child's plan. So if there are educational needs, if there are psychological needs, if there's health needs, you don't have lots of different reports from lots of different people. You have one report, one plan that brings all those needs together. That is an aspiration. In some places that's worked quite well, in others that hasn't quite been pulled off yet. But that is the aspired to approach and in some places they have managed to, to, to uh, get to the place where they do have one child's plan for, that encompasses different needs. And each, the named person and anyone who encounters a child, child has these questions that they sort of bear in mind. What's getting in the way of this child or young person's well-being? Do I have the information I need to help this child? What can I do now to help this child? What can my agency do? And what additional help, if any, may be needed from others. And this was a reaction to, we had been for a period of time going quite down a kind of risk-oriented, forensic, investigative approach, which was very much about anyone had any concerns about a child, they would refer to social work, social work services to fix it. And the recognition that there's many situations where you don't need the full-on kind of forensic investigative approach uh, and actually what people were needing was just a little bit of extra help that could be delivered through the universal services. So the aim was to move it back onto the universal services themselves first to say look is there something I can do here without necessarily referring on to somebody else and only pull on others if you really need it and to reserve the forensic investigative aspect of uh, promoting the well-being and protection of children to those where you really did need that compulsory element. Because one of the other things we were finding is that sometimes universal services were invoking the child protection system, the statutory side, not so much to compel parents to seek to take the help, but to compel other services to give it. You know, so it became a it became more of a marker to try and get other people to give a service to a child. And that, that this was a, an attempt to move away from that misuse of a, of a statutory compulsory system. So the scenario we all can help with the identification of concerns and the, the, the markers around the, the, the wider perimeter of that, the confident individuals, responsible citizens, effective contributors and successful learners, those are the outcomes for the curriculum for excellence, the educational aspirations. Um, so they uh, have provided a very helpful kind of common language that different disciplines are using, using to assess what might be happening with a child. There is a My World Triangle, which is the assessment framework, which is akin to and similar to the Department of Health Triangle that some of you will have used, I know, in, in, in Australia, adopted in some places elements of the Department of Health one. But this was very deliberately worded from the perspective of the child. So it is, it's, the elements are like keeping me safe, being there for me. So it was deliberately worded from the perspective of the child. And this is a common assessment framework that different disciplines use and different disciplines do use. So the police use it, health, education, social work, other disciplines. And then for more complex situations where you are looking at potentially more higher risk situations, there's a resilience matrix to begin to balance out the protective factors, the risk factors, the adversities and the vulnerabilities. That matrix people have anecdotally has struggled a little bit more with aspects of that in some of the other in some of the universal disciplines so we've been doing more thinking about how to train people in, in use of that so in terms of how it is working out um, so far we've done some we've been doing a lot of work in sterling around uh, child neglect and how people respond to neglect and uh, as part of that we undertook a survey of the child protection committees uh, which are the multidisciplinary um, committees that they have in every local authority that do the planning for um, uh, the protection of children. Um, and one of the questions in that survey was uh, the, about the impact of GERFEC on the earlier identification of children who might be at risk of neglect. And the, apart from a couple of negative comments that I've picked out there, the rest were all really... Um, primarily positive comments that were coming back from those who were um, reflecting on the impact of getting it right for every child. And this reflects the anecdotal experience I'm hearing from people. And I recently had one of our social work students undertook her dissertation on um, getting it right for every child and had very similar comments coming back in, in the research that she undertook. So people are identifying that there's earlier identification of issues, there's more robust assessment processes, Again, this notion of a common language for all the professionals, 
being helpful. Um, and anecdotally, people are talking of a reduction in the numbers of children that referred to the children's hearing system um, and on the child protection register. Without proper robust research into outcomes, it's, you have to be careful about some of these proxy measures. It may be a good thing, it may not be a good thing. I mean, that's the kind of thing you need to get at with more in-depth research. Um, but certainly a sense of early intervention, earlier intervention, uh, more earlier concerns being raised and responded to. Of course, one of the problems is that this is being rolled out, as I say, at a time of austerity when some of the um, support services are being cut. So people are struggling with aspects of, of implementing some of this. And I just wanted to just, in the last part, just talk about some of the um, questions, though, that remain in terms of what we're trying to do with Getting Right for Every Child and some of the bumps in the road along the way. So this is just three of the main questions I identify that we need to think about in Scotland in terms of maintaining the momentum of this. And one of the other issues, I suppose, in terms of maintaining the momentum is it's no longer a bright, shiny object for politicians. And there's a danger that once it's no longer a bright, shiny object, it loses political attention and they're looking for something else. And it's very, very hard to do the hard graft of actually just seeing through making sure policies are continued to sustained on the ground. And I think we're at that point now where we need to really do that hard graft and not get deflected onto other bright, shiny objects. So can we move back from a preoccupation with risk? Is What is the general public readiness for moving upstream to a more wellbeing approach? And is it ambitious enough? Um, in terms of the preoccupation with risk, um, particularly in relation to working with neglect, it's very, we know from all the research that it's not helpful to think of um, different pathways for children either in need or at risk. Children particularly at risk of neglect, it's the, the risks come from the unmet need. Um, and that rather than thinking of bifurcating pathways, we need to think of different stops along the one, the one pathway to help the children. And there was a period of time where there was a real uh, a load of preoccupation of effort and resource to try and sort children into different categories of being at risk or in need or family support or uh, child protection. There was a period of time when they were called either GERFEC or child protection, which really wasn't in the spirit of the model. There's been a lot of work to try and integrate these different approaches so that we are thinking much more of part one pathway with different stops along rather than trying to sort into different pathways. Uh, but there are still elements of that and there are real concerns and probably with genuine basis that the more you think of a universal approach, the more you think about well-being, there's a danger of both spreading your resources too thin, um, the fact that you can't just move your resources from downstream to upstream, you have to fund both. You can't just shift it because it takes a while for the benefits to, to come through. And also that you might take your eye off the ball of some of the really serious risks that, and really difficult situations that some children are, uh, are living with and that you have to not lose your focus on some of the really dangerous situations that some children are living in. And to try to maintain that combination of empathic support for parents with a real focused attention to the risks that some children may be experiencing. So that is uh, an ongoing issue, I think, and it's very difficult for any country to just get that right. It's a constant kind of reevaluating of, of, of where we are and trying to keep that balance right. That's not just an issue for, for Scotland. And here's a quote from an Australian review, as Australia adopts more elements of the family service orientation, is there a risk that services could become too parent focused fail to act quickly enough to stop maltreatment? How would a balanced position best be achieved? It's very easy to write these sort of things, I have to say. We just put a little question mark at the end of it and I say, oh, okay, over to you. <laughs> um, is there really a readiness to move upstream? See, with the child protection system, it's very easy for the gen general population, general public to think, well, that's great, we've got a system, but it's for other people's children. But if you go if you start looking at well-being, if you start moving upstream, if you start talking universal, then that's everybody's children. Could be, you know, our child. Suddenly it feels different. And um, it comes at a time where there is a huge amount of suspicion of the state. And we have the same discourse, very whipped up by the media, of the nanny state and fears of state surveillance. And um, there was... Um, an aspiration that we would move to a situation where it was okay to ask for help if you needed help. 
So the idea for the national parenting strategy, for example, so we have a culture where we're asking for help is not seen as a sign of failure, but as positive action. But of course, it isn't as simple as that. Um, because for people, uh, parenting is such an emotional issue. And to ask for help about that is really scary. And here's a quote from a parent in some research that we did. Which it's a fine line between asking for help or not. Will it look like I'm struggling? Will they think I'm struggling too much to take my bearings away? And we still face that, that massive challenge that there is a real fear that what the state wants to do is take your children away. And I, I remember from that, from working in social work, you're often trying to convince people, we don't want to take your children away, we want to support you. But that fear is still very prevalent. And it partly linked to the fact that well-being is a very broad con concept, very hard to pin down. And anything or anything that may be affecting a child might fall into the purview of affecting their well-being. So that could leave it really wide open and draw many, many more people into a net. A net. And this came to the fore in relation to the, the uh, cementing of getting it right for every child into a piece of legislation, Children and Young People's Act. That was done in order to kind of maintain the momentum, but it had a bit of a backlash because once you start putting something into legislation, you have to really think about how you word it. And this is the, describes the functions of the named person about advising, informing, and supporting, helping a child or young person. But it also had an element of discussing or raising a matter about a child or young person with a service provider and that you could share information with other disciplines. So it was to try and overcome the fact that information sharing was not going on as well as it should. But the, to broaden out, you can information share in relation to well-being. Being. It's always been okay to share information in relation to child protection, high risk. Well-being, uh, the idea was to broaden it out to provide more support. But it was not explicit enough about the issues of consent and seeking parental consent. It was based on an assumption that professionals would use sensible professional judgment about bringing people along with them and speaking to parents and, to and gaining their consent. But that was not explicit enough. And it was challenged. It was taken to court. The Scottish government was taken to court by a coalition of some Christian organisations and parents who were um, challenging the state intrusion. And it was a Supreme Court judgment which did identify that the aim of the act was legitimate and benign, but that the information sharing provisions did have a risk of potential disproportionate interference with Article 8 rights. Um, so it just goes to show that you can try to do a good thing, um, but end up being accused of doing a bad thing. So the, the Act is still in force, but elements of it have been suspended and they're being rewritten. And the, 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 the Deputy First Minister has recently reasserted their um, commitment to uh, the name person aspect of the act, but that they're going to make more explicit the importance of bringing parents along with you and uh, not, not telling parents that you're going to ask others if they need particular help uh, in relation to child well-being. So making that much more explicit. But the media coverage of this has been very unhelpful because it's raised everybody's fears about nanny state and state surveillance. Uh, and you may well face similar issues, the more you try to go move away from a tight forensic investigative system that's only for other people's children. Um, and if for everybody, help seeking is hard, you know, to ask for help is difficult. You need to have a cultural support. You need to have cultural support for more, for the notion that it's okay to ask for help with parenting. And that requires quite a bit of preparation on the ground. And the, the, the final question is whether GERFEC is ambitious enough because I go back to this question about is Scotland the best place in the world to grow up? And, and it, I'd say it depends where you live and how deprived you are. We're in a situation of massive inequalities and growing inequalities, as, as Frank uh, showed us earlier on. And in another research project I'm involved in, which is a four UK nation comparative study led from Coventry by Paul Bywaters, we've been looking at patterns of interventions in children's lives, children's families' lives, connected with the level of deprivation in which they're living. And it's come out very, very startling that uh, I mean, this, this pattern applied across the whole of the UK, but I've just picked out the Scotland, Scotland figures, that children who live in the most deprived 10% of small neighbourhoods are 20 times more likely to be looked after and accommodated, that's it, i.e. in out-of-home care, than those living in the 10% least deprived. And kind of, it's the sort of thing that everybody kind of knows, you know, but when you actually see it in statistics, it's very stark. And it raises really big questions for us about um, the impact of 
inequalities, deprivation, and the intersection of inequality and state uh, involvement in children's lives. So yes, Scotland might be the best place to grow up if you're in the lovely leafy parts of uh, Morningside in Edinburgh, but in some of the most deprived postcodes in the West and around Glasgow, it may be one of the worst places in Europe to grow up. And so we have to ask whether we are we need to step, whether getting it right for every child is really sufficiently focused on some of the more underpinning structural issues that are affecting child well-being and whether we actually as a nation if we want it to be the best place to grow up we need to really tackle those structural inequalities that are affecting well-being in the first place because it's still a little bit downstream it's still once there's a bit of you know once well-being is affected we'll respond do we need to look higher upstream there is a child poverty bill that's been developed in Scotland. There's a Fairer Scotland initiative that's looking at tackling um, inequalities. But as yet, there hasn't been a full integration between some of these policies that are looking at poverty and inequality and the getting it right for every child model. So if we truly want to, to, to look at um, taking a national approach to child well-being, we would need to bring these aspects more closely together so that we're really overtly seeing reductions in inequalities as a, as a child well-being issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Daniel, uh, which rounds out three, I think, really meaty uh, presentations today with so much food for thought. Um, to put a bit of consolidation around, uh, around them, I'd like to introduce Professor Patrick O'Leary, Head of the School of Human Services and Social Work at Griffith University and a presenter at this year's Child Aware Approaches Conference, who will provide a short reflection on the, the, the presentations we've had. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, in the short space of time we've got left, there's Trying to give a potted version is going to be a challenge, but uh, I, I think there's some real um, things that draw together just in, in drawing the three presentations together, and that that is that a universal approach is one uh, one way, but still, as both Frank and and, and Bridget highlighted, that um, across the two countries, Scotland and Australia, where you grow up and how deprived you are does still matter in your outcomes, and that's very clear. We saw from, from Frank in some of the, 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 the two other presentations that we have clear evidence about the negative effects of uh, being deprived or abused on childhood long term, and that investment uh, does uh, pay off when it uh, comes early and it's not after harm has happened. Um, and Frank very uh, clearly articulated one of our challenges is fragmentation and we need glue <laughs> across this. And in fact, Keith highlighted an area where we can have glue, an example of um, how to address child safe environments in institutions. Instead of purely thinking about screening and managing potential offenders, what what we see is that we're actually dealing with the situation, dealing with uh, that uh, um, area of risk rather than simply thinking we can manage people. Um, across all of this, we, we saw from the example from Scotland, the, the pathway's not easy. Um, but a national approach it needs to be aspirational. There needs to be a message. There are some really interesting distinguishing factors about how we defined a child protection system and also an enabling system for child wellbeing. And sometimes the two get all collapsed. And I think some of the challenges there um, that the speakers highlight is what can we really uh, link to the impact of particular aspects of the system? Does the glue make a difference or does particular services make a difference? These are some important questions. 
Now, we've got about five minutes left. So um, I'm going to kick off a couple of questions. I invite the speakers to come up. Um, and while you're coming up, I'm going to ask a quick question to you, Keith, and then we'll go to the floor. So, uh, Keith, you, you spoke very clearly about involving the community, involving organisations. In Australia, we've had the Royal Commission that focused on institutions, but our statistics on child sexual abuse very much show that the majority of child sexual abuse happens within the family. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about, what we can take from what you, your work and apply it to the family. Very creative question. And can I take a simpler one, please? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that at its core, the idea behind situational prevention is shifting the focus from after the fact dealing with harms to thinking about proactively looking at risks and addressing those. Um, even though we're not doing this in this project because this project is focused on doing that in organizations, I don't see any reason why we couldn't look at exploring an approach that would look at home situations and look at the social um, and uh, peer networks that are around that and try to encourage parents to be empowered uh, to address some of those risks that exist with our support and our guidance. Um, one of the things I really like about the approach that we're talking about is it's at the very local level. So when we talk about looking at organizations, we're inviting the organization to be in the driver's seat and to be in charge and to be empowered. Um, I think that, that asking parents or trying to support parents in being more empowered to take over and be the driving force in terms of creating a more positive environment for themselves and their children um, is very consistent with a lot of the policies that we have already. So I don't see why we couldn't look at taking the same simple steps and trying to re-gear it so that it fits better for home visits or fits better for thinking about um, working at looking at the um, looking at home situations in terms of risks. And I know we already do that. So I actually think that. Uh, as I think about, there's probably a lot of compatibility with using the same kind of process. Thank you. Is there any questions on the floor? Yes. <laughs> and you talked about place-based approach. Um, and then we had the, the, the discussion around what's happening in Scotland, um, getting a right for every child, and there are multiple examples, as you would know. A particular one that I love um, is the child-friendly leads. So I'm just wondering, in terms of, um, you know, if we were to do some significant system reform around better outcomes for family and children, what does that actually look like in terms of that, that you know, how those those components, proportionate universalism and the importance of place, interact and come together? Um, that, that's a great question. I, I think the AEDC data give us a wonderful base because um, those data are available. When we set out to score the AEDC and map it and whatever, we identified communities. So there's already geographic communities with a, a really good base of data. Um, and when I talk about more glue, I think rather than picking ex-disadvantaged communities uh, and giving them lots and lots of money, what I'd rather do is pick all the communities and give them uh, a couple of salaries, for example. You develop some sort of framework that um, whether you call it a community links worker or a coordinator or whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, so the work our centre does with communities when, is to go in there, identify who the stakeholders are, get them around the table, often to discuss data. Data bring people around the table uh, to discuss why we're seeing these sorts of results. Uh, work with them to identify resources, map resources, look at all the sources of data. And Australia's in a pretty strong position compared to other jurisdictions around the world that I'm aware of. We, most communities have some pretty good data. The ADC is just one example of it. Start to build a profile of that community. And so we're already getting those stakeholders to think a bit differently. 
This is not top down us knowing what to do and giving them a yellow one or a red one or a green one. It's working with them. What is it about your community that's good, that's strong? Where are the weaknesses? What would you like to see different? So they start to develop a plan and, and we facilitate, we help them, we give them resources to do that. Um, so they want to improve this, change that, decrease that, etc. It's their plan, not our plan, okay? Um, and then ideally we would provide those communities with a couple of salaries of people to um, uh, work to those stakeholders and begin to glue together services. Um, uh, and then what I would, what I'm suggesting you know, to, to you guys at the department, it's not two salaries forever. You know, give them say $200,000 for two years, then 150 the third year, 100 the fourth year, et cetera, et cetera. Make it really clear at the outset that uh, this is not forever. And communities find the resources. You know, there's lots of sources of funding there. But to our mind, that that's the best chance of sustainability because it's not our plan that, you know, it, that we provide top down to those communities. It's their plan that we've helped them develop. They own the plan and they're interested in sustaining it because it's their plan, not our plan. So that's a simplified answer. Now, of course, it's more complex than that, yeah. but that's the principle. There's a quote I sometimes use in my talks um, that, that comes from a Chilean uh, writer and philosopher. It's actually in Spanish, but I had it translated. The only thing you create from the top down are holes. Everything else has got to be a combination of top down, bottom up. And so it's this ownership. You know, what is it about this, these families and these communities that, where kids aren't doing as well. And had, once we identify those, how can we, we be working with those families and with those communities in partnership to help build capacity? So it's not about fixing things. I already want to move away from fixing things. It's not about that. There's nothing to fix. It's really working with families and communities to help them meet their aspirations for creating um, better capacity. That's the short version. I can give you a two hour version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Daniel from the National Framework team here. Uh, a question for Professor uh, Kaufman. I was interested to hear about um, the work that you've been doing directly with parents in local communities and working with um, organisations to identify issues. Um, do you have some further um, thoughts that you could uh, give us on the particular models that are uh, more effective in engaging parents and, and how they work? That'd be good. Sure. Uh, one of the things that was interesting to me is when we started working with youth serving organizations at is how little the parents were engaged. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, some of them literally complained that they would, when it was time to pick up their child, they would get a phone call that asked them to push their child out the door so they could slow down, grab the child and leave. Um, it was challenging to go ahead and engage parents and uh, I'm only partially teasing, the strategic use of pizza in our country was one of the most effective things we found for engaging parents. And that seems kind of silly, but it, part of what we learned was that in many of these contexts, that was the relationship uh, parents came in when they had to sign their kids up, uh, when they had to be present, but there was such a long history of not being invited to be a collaborator that it was almost an adversarial position. Oftentimes the, the organizational staff was literally annoyed or angry at a lot of the parents or parents in general. The parents looked at the organization with suspicion and it was very interesting to try to create a process where you were asking parents to come in as experts. And that's literally what we were doing. We were asking them as key informants to come in and be another perspective on the organization and the organizational experience. And it was still challenging because we were fighting uphill that long history of parents not being invited and feeling disenfranchised. And I started out by teasing about pizza. I truly will tell you that offering food, offering an invitation, making very clear about framing this as we want you as an expert to come and help us enhance safety in the organization made a big deal. If we had more time, I could tell you more strategically about how to use the pizza. 
because if you give it out too soon, they leave. Okay. <laughs> if you wait too long, they become cranky. But if you can figure out where the air is coming from and tip it open just a little bit, you can really keep their motivation up. <laughs> so actually, it, it was really been it was interesting because the organizations were um, were not convinced that it was valuable to have parents come in, and it wasn't until parents and even more so asking teenagers for their input. When we compared the independent risks that were identified by staff who spend every day in these facilities, and then we asked parents with well, their perspective, and we asked teenagers theirs, um, it was interesting how many unique risks came up on the parent and the, the adolescent um, list that didn't appear on the staff list. So for them, they became convinced because there was value in what the teenagers and the parents could bring to the equation of creating a safer environment. Thanks for asking. Thanks, Steve. I think in the interest of not going too much over time and getting yeah. cranky uh, about timelines, um, <laughs> we might close the questions just there, but um, um, very important questions. I'm sure we could go on for some time with further questions. So thank you very much for asking those questions. I'll invite Brian up um, to, to close the... Um, um, proceedings for today. So, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Patrick, and um, and, and thank you um, to, to our speakers. Um, I, I've had uh, a, a double dose of um, not just a cold, as you may hear, actually, um, but a, a delightful double dose of hearing now, um, the, these presentations, both at the Child Aware Conference um, Monday, Tuesday, and, and now today. Um, I am just bowled over by the richness and um, uh, the, the messages that I think we can take away um, from the presentations. One of the things that we were really trying to explore in the Child Aware Conference this year um, was we wanted to keep, of course, the focus on the national framework for protecting Australia's children, particularly the three national strategies under the third action plan. Um, and so we really fully explored uh, those and we had a terrific roll up of around 330, 340 people um, over the last couple of days, really vibrant discussions. What we also wanted to do was try to sort of think about where, where we go to from here. Um, the national framework is a plan for 2020. It's a groundbreaking thing, never been done before um, in terms of the Commonwealth's leadership role in this particular area of focus. Um, so either what happens next or what happens in addition to, to that sort of policy architecture. And so we were really posing a national um, social policy uh, question. Uh, is there something else that we can think about um, to, um, to augment uh, the, the strong directions that were already set and the, the developments over the last decade where we are taking increasingly strong national approaches in things like having national standards for out-of-home care, having a national research, research agenda, having a national children's commissioner. Um, so there's a momentum. Where was that going? Hence, it was very important um, to hear, particularly from, um, from Bridget, about the getting it right for every child. Was there a getting it right for every Australian child uh, variant mm. of that that we could, we could think about? Um, and so um, we, I think this has advanced our, our thinking um, uh, as well through, through the last couple of days. Um, is this a good idea for Australia? Is this something that we need to ponder? What are the, what are the pitfalls that we can learn from, from elsewhere and, and take it forward? But I think the common connecting thread through these presentations is also the really strong focus on the early intervention and prevention agenda. This, to me, it comes through so strongly. Where we've got to with the National Framework Third Action Plan are really nice green shoots uh, in this three years uh, of thinking about and trying to put in place early intervention and prevention things like the BCAP trial, um, really significant um, step in that direction. Um, probably the fourth action plan, I think we'd see, want to emphasise that, that more. So this is the strategic direction I think we're, we're travelling in. The conference has added to that. The speakers have certainly added to that um, to that uh, to that thinking about how can we now build on on these preventive approaches and really deeply embed them um, uh, and to get the collaboration going. And I'll finally uh, I'll close on this by saying one of my pet themes and um, 
I'm probably boring people to death about it, is about expanding the collaborative space. That is getting as many uh, players around the table um, to talk about policy issues from non-government, research sectors, um, from governments, plural, um, and, uh, and creating the common narrative. And going back to Frank, one of Frank's point, points earlier, which I so thoroughly agree with, um, if we can get a more unified um, voice, uh, regardless of where we're, we're sitting in the spectrum of, of, uh, of, of all of those players, uh, about the common needs um, for uh, every child to grow up safe and well uh, in, in Australia, I think that would be a terrific thing. Could you please join with me in thanking our speakers again? Finally, thank you very much for coming along and thank you the department and Chris, thank you uh, for putting on, on today's um, forum, um, which also I should say is in the heart of National Families Week and we'll talk about that more later on I think. And in the interest of comic production stuff, don't forget that you are.